Uh, kia ora koutou, ko Rebecca Clarkson Aho. Um, I'm the Principal Advisor for Aquaculture Direct. Um, we provide a range of consultancy services for aquaculture. Um, I've got a relatively lengthy background um, working in the regulatory space, um, providing advocacy for the, um, for the aquaculture industry. Um, first for the Muscle Industry Council, um, and then when uh, Aquaculture New Zealand was formed as a united voice for the sector, some more experience now with salmon and oysters. Um, and then in the last two years um, as a consultant, I've been working alongside marine farmers, really trying to help them find their way through the various regulatory challenges. Um, so, oh, hang on, let me figure out my technology. Um, <laughs> So I've seen firsthand over that period of time um, the passion and innovation that the marine farming pioneers brought to the industry. The way they worked alongside each other and together to adapt and develop the industry into the success it is today. And I've also seen and sought to assist with the various regulatory challenges that have built up over time. Um, and I guess my key message is that um, in the early days, the mussel farming and the, and the oyster farming and salmon farming sector, you know, they started in the 70s and 80s, and they did that by trialling, by doing. You know, they, could, they, could, they had the freedom to actually give things a go and work together, and if something didn't work, then they'd try something else. Um, and today's framework is, you know, it's, it's different, and it's different for a reason, because it's important to protect our marine environment, but there are a lot more hurdles to being able to give things a go, and that, that is hampering, potentially, you know, um, the development of a new sector. So at first glance, it may seem that seaweed should fall in behind the progress and into the frameworks that guide the existing species, but my experience is that it doesn't necessarily work like that, nor should it. I think for the most part, most part everyone here is in this room because we see seaweed as a great opportunity. It's potential environmentally, culturally, socially, and potentially um, significant economically. And yet in a regulatory sense, there are many unknowns, and our regulatory framework is precautionary. Both the RMA and the Fisheries Act have underlying principles of precaution. It makes sense to take care with new and unknown proposals in the marine environment. However, it's also important to enable trial and error especially for a sector that has such overarching government and community support in principle. And I'm not sure we have the balance right just at this point. As an example, if you calculate the amount of money that the aquaculture industry has collectively spent over the last 20 years, just being able to stay where it is, doing what it is doing, and calculated that over the amount that the industry has earned in that time, I think it would be a stark signal that aquaculture is one of the most heavily regulated um, activities in our country. So do we expect that from an emerging sector to survive in that environment? Bringing seaweed into the same framework, including expecting it to occupy the same location in the same ways, means that the early adopters are going to carry a heavy regulatory burden that they can't afford without developed pathways to market. And I think that balance needs to change somehow. One example is the differences in the way we add species to existing mussel farms across the country. Different levels of evidence and cost are required depending on the region. And this can quickly become a barrier for an entity that's trying to trial different species and techniques in different locations. Trial is possible, of course, through the research framework, but unless you have sufficient permitting in place to be able to commercialise, then you can't, try, you can't have commercial trials. And that further develops, further hampers development. So you need to consent to farm both in the water and on land, but you also need permits to access the, the brood stock, and the Fisheries Act is not set up to enable this. There's currently a schedule of species that you can, ha that you can harvest off your farms, called harvestable spat, and a schedule of species that you can't access through a fishing permit, and both of these schedules serve to create barriers to access to seaweed brood stock. And there is a workaround exemption, and I've been helping some clients with that. 
but it's another level of form filling, consultation, time and cost. And these all add up. I um, caught up with representatives from MPI last week to discuss the various plans in place to, to set the framework so that it d does suit seaweed a little bit more. And they do have some plans in place. They've basically got some workarounds that they planned um, for access to broodstock. And, um, and they've been talking about it for a while and it was potentially the, an opportunity to do that with the Fisheries Act amendment, but that hasn't happened. Um, but so the workaround that they are looking at doing is um, making a broad, a, a broad um, application for exemption for moratorium species, um, which would apply to, to all operators. But that still requires a process and, and broad consultation. And then they're also looking at creating a special permit um, type for access to aquaculture broodstock. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I have another client who's looking to develop land-based seaweed facilities, but its main concern is whether they'll be able to access seawater. The consenting process for placing seawater intake structures across the CMA is daunting. So they can't choose a site based on where would be best for them. They have to try and find a, a site that's got existing seawater infrastructure and consents. And this significantly limits their options. I've had the privilege of being involved in the Sustainable Seas Framework development. And, and it's been a, a you know, really great experience sort of talking, for example, with people like Lucas for the range of issues that he's facing. Um, and it has, this, as um, Rob was saying, it's got a range of case studies of actual operators that are, you know, the, the opportunities that they see and the barriers that they've already faced. And they are united in their call for urgent pathways for trial and error. Other challenges relate to the maze of regulations and requirements in product development, labelling and market access. We talk of seaweed as aquaculture, but it's not an animal product, and so it's regulated under the Food Act. And then that means that detailed food control plans are required up front and are difficult to amend, and trial and error are problematic in this context. Another challenge is finding the category within which the seaweed will sit. The product range is extensive and potentially even unknown. Um, and if, but if a seaweed pioneer has a question that they need to ask a regulator about or, or even suggestions, who do they talk to? That, you know, there's experiences of, of people having to ring multiple government numbers and explain their situation multiple times and still not getting anywhere. And then where do our international markets turn for assurance that our products are what they say they are? As a sector seeking to position itself as high value and premium, quality and market assurance backed by government will be critical. And then Lucas referred to, showed us the prolific underia growing on the marine farms in the Coromandel, but the Biosecurity Act provisions are set up in, the, in a way that means that he can't farm it. Um, and MPI have been talking for a long time about a review. It's, it's broadly recognised that underia needs a review, but. It's still underway. <laughs> so what are some broader solutions? As an overarching principle, I'd like to see a smoother feedback loop between the scientists, the regulators and the farmers. What are the real questions that need answering for innovation to be enabled? And what can wait till further down the track? How much precaution is too much? How much uncertainty is acceptable? Is there a forum for better information sharing to serve as a platform for individual proposals? Could we collectively identify what questions need answering first and seek science that answers those questions and is okay with leaving the rest unanswered? Can we identify areas in the marine environment through spatial planning where commercial scale trials can be enabled without waiting for further proposals, further RMA changes? The seaweed sector framework has a regulatory issues lift out which sets out the current challenges and a range of solutions and this will be an evolving conversation over time. 
We also need strong leadership and partnership between government and the sector. ANSA is leading the way in creating a united voice for the sector. It would be great to see some kind of regulatory one voice which could act as a conduit through a range of unforeseen regulatory questions that will arise as the sector progresses. Some kind of seaweed unit which has connections across MPI, MFAT, MB, DOC and local government. The unit could host a database of issues, questions, reports, recommendations and be staffed in a way that provides a consistent point of contact for the range of challenges on the horizon. Again, the seaweed framework case studies were united in their call for this. Personally, I'm really excited about being part of the journey. I'm learning as I go too, and there's not that many of us who are experts, but I'm okay with saying that I have uncertainty, but I'm just gonna give it a go. Thank you.